when I asked to see it all. And the uh-huh. Lord said, okay, we'll see how far we can get with this. Because he knows the end date. When I was talking about booking my cruise to go to Antarctica, I had this man say, well, you know, you're going to go through the Strait of somebody or another. And that's where all the accidents happen there. It's where people die on cruise ships. And I thought, do I need to hear this right now? I don't care. He knows where I am going to die, how Mm -hmm. I am going to die, when I am going to die, or if I'm going to die. Well, welcome everybody back to the podcast, episode 105. And we're coming to you from Chino, California, on location with one of my favorite people, to be honest with you, somebody that I've known now for probably a good nine, 10 years, and it's definitely had a huge impact as far as the direction of my life, uh, leading me to some opportunities that have just been life-changing and, and have been the absolute joy that I have. And so I'm looking forward to talking with her today. She's an awesome lady, very active, involved in a ton of ministries, and a good leader and a great example, and that is Ellie Gray's. So thank you so much for letting us come in your house. Appreciate that. We had our choice of rooms here with <laughs> lots of different backdrops, and, and we found a nice one. Well, they were all nice, but so it was a hard choice. But why don't you go ahead? A lot of people that are watching this do know you, but there's going to be a lot that don't. Um, so I, I kind of want to take it a little different than, than I do with a lot of guests, because what I like about your story is that you had a big portion of your life where you didn't really even know the Lord. You weren't serving the Lord. Um, and then once you did, you just really jumped in. You've done a lot a lot of great and powerful things. So kind of give us a summary maybe. I know, you know, we don't have three hours, but uh, and it might take that. But a summary of your journey and even your faith journey a little bit. Well, first of all, I'm honored and I thank you so much for even asking me to be on the podcast Um, I know what a treasure you are to me, too. I appreciate that. um, But my journey has been fraught with uh, highs, high, high, and low, low, lows. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was very quickly, I was born and raised a Catholic. I went to college and I became a Buddhist. I married a Lutheran. We moved to California, and I studied with the Jehovah's Witnesses and the, the um, Mormons. I was a Mormon for three years. Mm. And all of that time, none, none of those incredible, huge religions made any sense to me. Mm. I found flaws in all of them that I couldn't explain. And I have to have logic okay. to, my, to my thinking, to my reason for doing things. And it was only after my husband contacted lung cancer Mm. that I said, I need God and I don't know where to find him. And my brother said, grab your Bible and Mm. go to Calvary Chapel. Mm. And so for the first time in my life, I was taught the Bible not man's doctrine, not man's traditions, not man's interpretations. I was taught the Bible. My husband passed away um, in March of 1990, so it's been 34 years. When he went home, the Lord let me see him go to heaven. I saw the people waiting on the other side, and I saw his spirit leave. And I got the peace that surpasses understanding. 34 years later, I still have that peace Mm. that surpasses understanding. But it was the surrender after my husband was gone two years that changed my life the most. Taking it literally, you must surrender to his will. I thought Mm. I had. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was doing really great. And I thought he and I had a great relationship. Sure. And the Lord said, nope, not yet, not yet. And so finally, I had gone to my very first women's retreat Mm -hmm. two weeks after my husband passed away. And a dear, sweet, godly woman had lost her husband five years earlier. And she said, Ellie, I'm going to give you your life scripture. Isaiah 54, 5, for your husband is your maker. The Lord God is his name. And of course, I laughed in her face. Mm -hmm. 
I'm, I'm not seeing this invisible person right. as my husband. Now I'm laughing mm -hmm. because I was so stupid. The Lord has my favorite song that you know well, C.C. Winans. Mm -hmm. I can just sing of the goodness of God. Yeah. Every step of the way, he has giving, given me an exciting life, a healthy life, mm -hmm. a rewarding life, but a closeness with him that I pray every person can experience because it's such a treasure. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was supposed to be good enough that he died on the cross for me, that he chose me to be his servant, that he chose me to be his daughter. Mm -hmm. But to have the added joy of the personal friendship and the personal direction from him has been just altering my entire life. Yeah. And I'm so dependent on him. One of the jokes when I, when I first started um, really surrendering and walking with the Lord is, okay, Lord, you want this life? It's yours. I have... I have messed it up bad enough on my own. Let's see what you can do with it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get out of bed and choose a pair of socks until I ask you what color. Okay. And that was the turning point in yeah. my entire life. And it's only when I do something without him, without asking him first, that I wind up in turmoil and confusion and mm -hmm. the peace I still have, but it's not quite as sharp. Yeah. And so I am, I am loving when I know that I'm in his perfect will. Years and years ago, I heard Chuck Swindoll say, you know you are in the perfect will of God when you know you are invincible. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I feel. Yeah. I feel like he's in charge. I'm not. He's leading me. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be awesome, whatever he chooses for me to do, because he's never disappointed me. Amen. Amen. Now, it's interesting that you're bringing this up because there's many a believer out there that's probably listening to your voice right now. And what you say right now probably is still like beyond what they're experiencing. So it was maybe a point of being pushed to see that there was something definitely missing that kind of God used to drive you to that but something you definitely don't regret making those decisions, right? As oh, far absolutely as... not. The only ones I regret is, number one, I didn't do it earlier in mm -hmm. my life. That would have saved me a lot of headaches and yeah. a lot of pain. But I also know that he uses those sufferings for his glory. Right. So um, I just wish I had, I had come to know him, know him sooner. Respond to me for this statement, because it's coming to my mind, because I've heard it before. And I'm sure that some of the people listening have heard it before. And it's kind of the voice of God saying, when we really get a glimpse of him and he really does something, it's like, wow, that is God. And he kind of tells us, you know, you would experience this all the time if you just give all of your life to me. And that's kind of what you're, you're saying here. How, think about it now if you hadn't done that, if you're not making those surrenders, if you're not totally dependent on him. It seems like your your life would just be so much different and, and not as fulfilling as it is. It'd be totally messed up, just mm -hmm. like it was before. Yeah. It was the surrender that changed everything. And the continuous, every day, surrender, every day. Mm -hmm. It isn't a one-time thing. Yeah. It's a one-time, on your face, on your knees, hands in the air. Okay. True surrender, but then you start to slip back when things get a little comfy. Sure. Now, it's, it's got to be every single day. So how do you do that? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you that question, because there's many people that have like the camp experience, the retreat experience, the conference experience, the concert, whatever it is, and they make that big life-altering decision, and you're right, three days later, it's already fading out. Yes. So that every day, how do you do that I mean, I'm sure not every day is perfect. You're going to struggle because you're human. But how do you keep coming back there when it's like, as D.L. Moody said years ago, we're like leaky vessels and, and, and we constantly have to be filled up with God? There is an incredible amount of peace in your heart. And I know so many people now are struggling 
to mm-hmm. feel peaceful with mm-hmm. all that's going on. Yeah. You know, they're they're they have anxiety and worry and then constant um, conflict and and just you can see it in the people around you where they are they are so concerned about everything. Mm-hmm. And once you have that peace, you'll do anything to get it back. Yeah. Anything. And when you realize how to get it back, it's real easy to get it back. Yeah. Just surrender again, surrender again, surrender again. Mm-hmm. And when you're in the Word and study exactly what that means to the Lord, mm-hmm. it's not your idea of how to get close to Him. It's yeah. what He has told you to do. And right. I'm reminded of when Moses came down from the mountaintop uh-huh. and he had to cover his face with a veil because it just glowed. Right. I've right. been accused of having that Holy Spirit glow. You do do that at times, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And once you have that that inner peace that no matter what else is going on in the world, once uh-huh. you have that inner peace, you'll do anything to get it back. So it daily, daily, I'll say, Lord, what are we going to do today? What mm-hmm. adventure do you have for me today? And just like last Saturday, I told you about, about getting this phone call from one of my dearest friends that she had two dogs for me. Right. I have been praying for those dogs mm-hmm. since last November. Mm. Okay. And I, I went to shelters. I called people. I told everybody. I put it on Facebook. I need, I have to have a dog in my life. Uh-huh. I just, that's just me. I yeah. love, and I knew what kind I wanted, and I, they couldn't shed, and they had to be affectionate, and blah, 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 blah. And I get this phone call a week ago. Mm-hmm. Well, how would you like two? Right. <laughs> that not only met every single check mark. Uh huh. The right size, they don't shed. They're hypoallergenic. They don't, I mean, but two of them, that's God. Absolutely. He does above and beyond what I can ever, ever imagine. Great example there. Well, let's tie it in now. So your greatest passions, there's there's three ministries that you're very involved in. Yes. Okay. Operation Christmas Child, Compassion International, and the Widows of Worth. Right? Yes. Um, why do those mean so much to you? And, and I know you, you basically pour your life into them. So maybe explain that a little bit. Well, we're called by God to fulfill the Great Commission. Yes. And that is to make sure that everybody on the planet has the opportunity to live with Him in eternity. Mm-hmm. And I know one of my joys was being a missionary to Ukraine for four years. I lived there. Mm-hmm. And my jobs occupation. I'm a registered nurse, still am. My job was to go around the country of Ukraine. And every time I would get to my destination and I would do what I was I was being paid to do, I'd say, do you have an orphanage? Do you have a hospital, a children's hospital or something? Mm-hmm. And that whole purpose was to bring God to Ukraine. Mm. And the Lord let me have So much fun, so much adventure, see so much of the world through that ministry. Yeah. And when I came back home after four years, okay, I'm riding the pine. What do you want me to do? Right. And it was when my friends took me to the processing center for the first time. Mm -hmm. And they don't do it this way anymore, but I got a, a phone call that my name had been submitted to be the um, community relations coordinator for South and East Los Angeles. Mm. And I kind of laughed and I thought, I don't even speak Spanish and I, I, I'm not quite sure where South and East Los Angeles is. Yeah. But I was leading the grief ministry at my church at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, th- we were doing this study, Experiencing God yeah. by Blackaby. And we were at the portion that, where it says, you are going to be, once you are a believer, you are going to be offered so many different places mm-hmm. that the Lord wants to use you, but is the Lord telling you that plate is yours, not the 50 you're being offered is your name on that plate. Mm-hmm. And so I asked the grief ministry to pray with me and see if my name was on the OCC plate. Mm-hmm. And so I interviewed and, and was accepted for the position. And they said, the first thing you need is a team. 
So I went back to the grief ministry and I said, is your name on that plate? Mm -hmm. And six of them are still with me today, 18 years later. Yeah. That's right. So they have they have been my core. They have been my my support. They have been just the most fabulous knife sharpening iron because we knew mm -hmm. each other as friends before we got into the ministry. Sure. So that was that was awesome. But trying to get back into being an American again, and now being with Operation Christmas Child, one mm -hmm. of the first churches I went to to make a presentation on Mission Sunday was a church in Corona. And the very next table was Compassion International. Mm. And I said, tell me about Compassion. And yeah. I want to tell you about Operation Christmas Child. Mm -hmm. And I saw how the two of them meld together to reach sure. the kids of the world and show them the goodness of God. Right. So I said, okay, I'll do a kid, you do a shoebox. So we got into that. Well, not too much longer later. And one of my, the heart of my desires has been to see the world. Lord, mm -hmm. I want to see it all. And so... I chose a little girl in um, Kenya, and when she turned 14, and I went to see her. Mm -hmm. If you're a serious student, I'm a serious sponsor, yeah. and I'll put you through college. Uh -huh. Wow, you must be really rich. No, that would have cost me about $30 a month if she wanted to go to medical school. Yeah. But I wanted her to know God with flesh. Mm-hmm to hug her and kiss her and sure. let her know that God has her in her sight in his sights to have her do whatever she wishes to do. Yeah. And I am now on my I want to say sixth or seventh um, that have graduated out of the program. They've aged out of the program. Mm -hmm. And so um I my last little boy that I've got on my book so far is a little boy in Guatemala, and he just turned 15. Mm. So as soon as the tours open up again with compassion, yeah. then I'll be going to meet him. But I also, uh, one graduated out, so now I am going to um, be supporting a little girl, and well, not a little girl, she's my oldest one, she's 19, mm -hmm. and she is in Haiti. Okay. Well, I, I'm kind of doing double duty here because that way I get to see the country. Yeah. Right. So, at the same time. Yeah. But with nice widows, benefit. widows started up at my church um, two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And the lady that runs it is just absolutely focused on having widows not feel alone, sure. not feel like they're unsupported, and knowing that the Lord chooses them as his favorites. How many mm -hmm. times in the Bible does it say, widows and orphans, widows yeah, and orphans? That's true. And one of my favorite scriptures is, don't touch my orphan, or my widows. Uh -huh. I will really beat you up if you touch my widows. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I feel like the Lord uses me to show what a surrendered life will look like. It's been 34 years for me. Yeah. And he just keeps using me more and more and more in that, in that uh, sense. Yeah. I just got back from Scotland, my 61st country. And um, while I was there, we stayed with a pastor and his wife. And in the evening, the pastor's topic was widows and orphans. Nice. Because he's very huge mm. on giving to the community. Yeah. And so he introduced this lady who feels called to lead the widows in Scotland, mm -hmm. in, right outside of Edinburgh. And so she said, so if any of you are widows and, and you would like to feel supported and, and get into that kind of fellowship, just let me know. Yeah. And I went up to her afterwards, and, and she, has, she has that countenance of a sweet saint. Yeah. And she, she looks at me with those sweet eyes, and I said, sweetheart, I'm here for you. Uh -huh. I want to support you. Yeah. And let me tell you my journey mm -hmm. of 34 years and how the Lord has, has used me and what a life this next chapter could be for you. Awesome. Awesome. So you were there at that time on purpose, obviously. God Absolutely. Set it up. Now, you're tying in some of these ministries, and, and what I love about it is you can speak from experience on this, because you hear these 
uninformed kind of ridiculous statements that are made or thrown out there, like with Samaritan's Purse, um, Compassion International. Oh, does the money really go there or is it going something else? Do, do children really receive these gifts and really receive this support or is it just being wasted elsewhere? And I think you can testify to the fact that you've personally eyewitnessed the fact that, yes, exactly what these ministries are saying is what's happening. I can personally, because Mm -hmm. number one, Samaritan's Purse has the most open books. You want to find out what their budget is? You want to find out what they spend it on? Go on the website. It's right there. Right. It's right there. I've been on two vision trips. Vision trip is when you get to go hand out the Mm shoeboxes. My first one was in 2013. I went to Uganda, and I got to hand out the shoeboxes. It was absolutely magical to see these kids' countenance just absolutely change. And then all of a sudden, their total attention was on this little booklet that they get with every Mm -hmm. single single shoebox called The Greatest Gift, which, of course, is Jesus Christ. And then they find out that they can actually learn about the Bible. There's 12 lessons Mm -hmm. in this beautiful program that's been established called The Greatest Journey. Yeah. But the $10 shipping that goes with every single shoebox is to pay for that printing. It's pay. Do you know right. we're now in over 95 languages? Yeah, So awesome. they get all of this information in their own language. Mm-hmm. And how awesome is that? They don't feel like, uh, well, I can't read English, so this isn't it. No, it's in their own language. And I keep copies of it just because it's so interesting to see the Thai language where you got all these little curly cues and everything. Right. We now have it in Arabic. Mm-hmm. You know, those kinds of things. Let's move on to Compassion International. My very, very first trip with them before I even ever went to see my little girl, I went to Thailand with them. And I was that persistent widow that was constantly into my tour guide. Mm -hmm. And I just, I loved her to death. But every single question, well, well, what are... What about this? And how do you handle that? And and how do you get these schools on board? And how do you follow up with them? And yeah. how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you? We got into Chiang Mai, and I said, tell me about how you handled these, these books and all of that and accountability and all that. She says, I have just the man for you. Ellie, meet this gentleman, she mm-hmm. introduced me to him. He's the director for the country. Nice. Okay. He says, come with me. Yeah. Opened all the books. Here's where they go. They sign up. They are investigated for a solid year. Uh-huh. They have to sign a pledge that they will absolutely open their books. Mm-hmm. When they start getting compassion money, they have to open their books of exactly yeah. where it's going. Right. Further proof for me on my very first trip with them still not even being a sponsor, Mm -hmm. was they went up to this one lady. I happened to be standing there with her. And with tears, they told her that her child was no longer going to be sponsored because the church refused to open the books. Mm. Heartbreaking. Yeah. Heartbreaking. Yeah. But it proved to me their integrity Mm -hmm. and their accountability. Yeah. Yeah. So I can, I can say unequivocally, I've now traveled with them five times. Yeah. I always do the same thing. You know, well, how do you handle this? Well, what about that? I happen to have lost a child um, in a particular country because they kicked out compassion mm. because of the proselytizing yeah. and because of the focus on Jesus. That spoke volumes to me. Mm-hmm. They're doing it right. Absolutely. And so let's kind of tie that in. So that's really the, the, these organizations use tangible gifts yes. as, a, as a gateway into what their main, I mean, I don't want to say it's the only purpose because obviously they want to help with the tangible things. They want to show the love of God with the tangible things, but they won't do it without being able to also share the truth. Right, Amen. which is a which is a huge thing, and so it, have, you've witnessed. Then, I mean, you were on the vision trips, and you've seen it with compassion. You've witnessed the difference that, just like it did for you, when you finally 
were able to be in a church where you were seeing the actual Word of God and not just being told what God said. Yes. Um, how that, the power of God's Word just changes people. Yes. And I've, I've seen it over and over mm-hmm. again. I have, I have a relative who, um, if I made a list of 50 people I wanted the Lord to save, she didn't even make the list. I, there's no hope there. Yeah. And I saw her change like Saul to Paul. Uh-huh. She's absolutely on fire for the Lord and has been a delight in my life. That's awesome. And, and I'm thinking back at Romans 1.16, where Paul's talking about being not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And it's interesting in that statement, he doesn't say, because I have the power of God. No, he's saying, because it is the power of God. Yes. That's the salvation. So that's where all the power is, right? And so we're seeing that with those organizations. We're seeing that over and over again, even as people are, are thinking about having conversations here in the States or whatever with people and why they should have Jesus in their life. Well, really, isn't the word where they need to take them? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you're seeing more and more and more how many lost people there are Mm -hmm. with no direction whatsoever and the strangest ideas Mm -hmm. that that you you have to shake your head you've got to be kidding how can you even think that yeah and yet there they are exactly and it just seems to be almost like a well i don't want to use that word but it's just yeah it's just a very strange thinking that when you know God and when God shed that light in your heart, it's just completely the opposite. Amen. Right? So let's go on a little bit. So when people are looking at you, they don't know. They're probably thinking early 60s, maybe, you know. I mean, that's what I would guess, not knowing you. You mind share? I mean, what what is your actual... I, I shouldn't ask that, but... I'm going to do it. You're going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyways. (laughs) (laughs) Throw me under the bus. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I am 81 and a half. 81 and a half. So most people at 81 and a half either don't make it there or they're definitely not traveling all over the world, doing all these ministries, doing all of that. They're they're taking the advice of the well-meaning people in their life that are saying, take it easy. Yes. Take it easy, right? Don't, Don't overdo. But well, I don't see any signs of slowing down. So I just booked my seventh continent yeah. cruise to Antarctica mm-hmm. next February. Exactly. So yeah, um, I got places to go. And, and, and that, that is absolutely awesome. So, so what is what's the reason? Uh, number one, I asked to see it all, and the uh, Lord said, "Okay, okay, we'll see how far we can get with this." Yeah, because um, He knows the end date. You know, everybody knows the dash, then there's the end date. Sure. She knows when that is. He knows where that is. Mm-hmm. I had I had a man, when I was talking about booking my cruise to go to Antarctica, I had this man say, well, you know, you're going to go through the strait of somebody or another, and and that's where all the accidents happen there. It's where people die on cruise ships. And I thought, do I need to hear this right now? Right. I don't care. Yeah. He knows where I am going to die, how Mm -hmm. I am going to die, when I am going to die, or if I'm going to die. That's true. Since he knows how much I love to travel, I figure I'm going to be in the rapture, which should be any time now, right? I'm good with that. I'm so (laughs) good with that. And I'm ready. Uh I'm ready. I could never understand how people say, oh, I just, uh, I can't wait to see Jesus. Now I get it. Mm -hmm. Now I get it. Yeah. But... Sadly for me, because of my age, I get to talk to so many people, and I'm going to quote one of my very favorite people, Clint Eastwood. He will be 94 mm. on May 31st, right. and they say, Clint, how do you stay so long, so young? Uh-huh. How do you keep going? How do you? What's your secret? And he said, I never let the old man in. Nice. And okay. I love that. Yeah. Because I've been told since you hit about. 35 or 40, or I don't know with this current generation, Mm -hmm. but you hit a certain stage or age in life, and people say, well, aren't you a little old to be doing that? Well, do you still go on roller coasters? Yeah, that's what they're there for. Uh I drive a sports car. 
1991 Miata that I love, and I love to go bombing up in the hills of the San Gabriel Mountains. And yeah. I keep I keep um, asking people to tell Pastor Jack that I want to drag race him because he's got a made-over Volkswagen. I gotcha. haven't been taken up on the offer yet. But that's because we'll he see. probably thinks he'd lose. That's probably... but this is true. Save face. And all yeah, that. exactly. Yeah. But think yeah. young. Don't let other people tell you how old you have to act. Mm-hmm. You know, there are times, and there's a difference between maturity and acting like an adult and a grown-up. Sure. And what does what does the Bible say? Be a child. Childlike faith. Childlike yeah. faith. Yeah. Come into the kingdom as children do. Mm-hmm. And I I feel like that every day when I, I watch the stupidest things on on YouTube. But as soon as it comes to God's creation, I can I love love his imagination. Yeah. And look at the, the differences in butterflies and birds and just the world. They, they've got this one series on it that's, uh, you know, 100 places you have to see before you die kind of thing. Mm-hmm. How many have I already been to? i got to check this out. Yeah. And I'm, I'm in awe and grateful for the ones I've seen. But now i got to get to the rest. Mm-hmm. Well, the reason, just just for a disclaimer, the only reason I asked you your age is because people wouldn't believe it unless you told them. Oh, so that's that's why I was why I asked because you are so active, and uh, you know people that are forty and fifty are nowhere near as active. I just had this conversation with a dear, <laughs> lovely woman who's fifty three, and she feels like, "What's my future, mm. girlfriend? I got shoes older than that." Yeah. You got to get out there. You got to go. Right. And one of my best stories that you've heard, probably heard me tell, I was in Siberia mm-hmm. in February. I couldn't figure out in the beginning why we were there in February. That didn't make any logical sense to me. A little cold, yeah. Little, yeah. little chilly. Yeah. Can't we go in like July? Uh-huh. We'll do a barbecue, right? Yeah. But the very wise lady with me. Debbie Bryson said, Mm -hmm. Ellie, when do you need the most encouragement? True. When it's dark all the time. Yeah. So I thought, if I'm going to Siberia, I want the whole Dr. Zhivago. I want the cart. I want the horse. I want the fur blankets. I want the whole thing. So I started Mm -hmm. praying, Lord, Mm -hmm. I want Dr. Zhivago. And so we get over there. You don't realize it's cold. You really don't, yeah. even though there's snow on the ground, because it's, but it's a dry cold. Right. So we get over there, and we're doing our thing. Does anybody have a horse? Does anybody have a, have a sleigh? Does anybody? Does any, and in three days, nothing, 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 nothing. One day, we come outside the mm-hmm. schoolrooms. And there's my horse. Wow. And there is my driver. Uh-huh. And they're all get up. And he's got the horse has the bells on his ears and the, mm-hmm. the fur blankets and the sled and everything. And I said, Oh my gosh. God answered my prayer. Nice. He answered my prayer to perfection. Get in the sleigh. Uh-huh. Let's get in the sleigh. And I can't tell you how many women said. I'm not. I, I'm not going to get in the sleigh. I, I don't know who that is. You don't. Yeah. You don't know where he's. Well, can you trust him? And I, I was dumbfounded mm. and so saddened. Yeah. But the lesson in that to this lady that I was talking to is mm. how many opportunities are God's hand all the way, mm. unequivocally, and you miss out because True. of fear. True. That's a lot of people's lives. So between the fear and letting the old man die, yeah, that's my secret. Gotcha. That's that's gold right there. So Operation Christmas Child, one of these organizations, um, it's big now and it's getting bigger all the time. But when you first started with it, uh, all these area teams and everything that we're seeing all over the place that had just begun, right? Yes. And so so what? As you took on an area coordinator, say here in Southern California, which is a big area, what was there as far as teams and things? Uh, there were 14 in three states, okay. 14 area teams in three states, California, Nevada, and Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And our very first area coordinator summit 
we had 14 leaders that showed up. Some had spouses, of course, upping the number. But um, we had no idea what the Lord was going to do. Mm -hmm. But we have evolved as a ministry to be massive, Mm -hmm. just massive. And the more we grow, the more the Lord blesses us. Last year, we hit 11,330,000. Thousand in one year. Right. We have never hit 11 million in one year. Our goal for next year is 12 million. We have never hit 12 million in one year. Yeah. But we have seen how people, once they realize the enormity of the ministry, the integrity of the ministry, mm-hmm. the purpose of the ministry, which is to evangelize children. Right. And to show them God's love. They're all on board. Yeah. There's nothing to fight against unless you want to fight against the Lord's ministry. Because this is his. Right. And Franklin is the first one to say that. Yeah. You know, I just had the opportunity. I'm also part of um, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Okay. I just became a chaplain. Awesome. Just. Mm-hmm. Just. At 80. Just became a chaplain. Yeah. You know, we got stuff to do, people. Right. If you don't have a job, you're not looking. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I got to go on the Frontera tour. And the Frontera tour was where Franklin um, was doing evangelistic outreaches from Brownsville, Texas, all along the frontier okay. of all of the states that border Mexico. Uh-huh. So he started in Brownsville and he wound up in San Diego in Chula Vista. Yeah. And I got to go to um, Tucson where he did a rally there. Okay. And I also was in Yuma where he did a rally there. Mm-hmm. And the thousands and thousands of people that came to hear him speak mm-hmm. are all looking for hope. Yeah. It was enormous. And the Lord absolutely filled up every single venue to full and overflowing. When I got to Tucson, the the venue there is um, a big, huge stadium, mm-hmm. and it's like half full. And I, I said, Lord, fill it. Yeah. You got to fill it. And by the time he got up to speak, mm-hmm. at five minutes to eight, they were still coming in. Mm. They were still coming in. And the place was maxed out. Yeah. I mean, people were on the lawns, people were, had brought chairs and all of that. They were up in the upper balcony. It was fabulous. And when he gave the altar call, thousands of people went down. Mm-hmm. And I saw the same thing in Yuma. Mm-hmm. It wasn't quite as big a crowd because the, the grounds couldn't hold it. But they were still coming in when Franklin was talking. Yeah, You know, and that kind of, of looking, looking for hope. Mm-hmm. Give me a reason to keep living. Give me a reason to understand what's going on in this world. And, and the Bible has it all. Jesus has it all. Yeah. And to hear that message from Franklin is just, it's so upbeat, so positive. Mm-hmm. And then you turn, within, with, with the coverage that I have of the entire ministry of Samaritan's Purse, then you hear about Operation Heal Our Patriots, where he's taking, mm-hmm. he's taking our military and reviving their marriages and, and getting them so um, into the spirit of what God has in a perfect, not a perfect, but a, a, a marriage that's the way God wants it. Right. Then you have law enforcement. Mm-hmm. Same thing. Yeah. It's restoring marriages. And then you have, have all of the, the heart mission and on and mm-hmm. on. It, and I, can't, I could talk for hours because I'm part of the International Disaster Relief. Mm-hmm. You know, where they're having the floods here in America, that's the local volunteer program with Samaritan's Purse. So there's no excuse for you not to be representing the Lord and Mm -hmm. showing showing the world the love of Christ. That's what we're still here for, right? That's why we're still here. And and I love what you're saying about that with Franklin as well, because a few years ago when I was given the privilege to pray at the opening of the Processing Center, I remember Randy Riddle introducing me to Franklin and telling him that I would be doing the prayer. And the first thing, the first thing that Franklin told me was, we want to just give thanks to God because we know he's the one that's provided all of this and we just want to give him glory. That's the first thing that he emphasized to me before anything else. Um, And he was a very humble, 
just very kind, yes. kind, kind person. So, um, and that was a great experience. But um, so it, it's crazy now. You take a look and you see. I mean, even from when I started with you. And it was all of what we consider San Gabriel Valley here in Southern California. There's now like five teams just from that point that split off from that group. Yes. Multiplied off. I'm sorry. Thank and, you. <laughs> and before you corrected me, I corrected myself. And, and that's really what's happening. And plus, you've seen others even before that. And, and you're a regional area coordinator at this point yes. over like a still a big area. Yes. Um, so they kind of like... They shrunk your territory and then they expanded again. That's what God does, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that must be crazy. You started off with with some people from your widows group years ago. And Grief. You, it was you, men and women. Okay, and and you now just go to seeing a ministry that has done over two hundred and ten million shoe boxes around the world, including. Ukraine, where you served. Yes. And they have a big network of, of ministry in Ukraine. Yes. Um, so everything's kind of full circle, but it all got just knits it all together, doesn't yes. it? In an amazing way. It's like way. a tapestry. Yeah. And and I think that often God does not get enough credit from people to, Absolutely not. to see that. Yeah. And <laughs> what what we also may skip over is this is all being done for his glory. Yes. Mm-hmm. It isn't for me. It isn't for you. It isn't for the teams or, or the team members. This is for him because he's the one that's making it happen. He's the one that's opening the doors. He's the one that's, that's showing us the path to take to do this. Mm-hmm. And what is his ultimate reason? As you know, being an area coordinator yourself, one of the biggest things that Franklin is stressing is unreached people groups. Right. The Bible says, when the last man hears, we're out of here. Mm -hmm. So the focus has been, who has not heard the name of Jesus Christ? Well, it's amazing to hear how many, and our particular focus on the West Coast, how many islands there are in just around Polynesia and and the Philippines and Indonesia and all of that that have never even heard the name of Christ. And yet the doors that the shoeboxes open mm-hmm. are amazing, amazing. And w- my story from Uganda, if I could share that. Sure. W- the first time that I went, we had, um, we had one of our outreaches in this area that literally, as we are coming up to the venue, it's in the worst section of town. It's all overlorded by the drug dealers and the cartels, and uh-huh. and this is where all of the murders happen and all of this kind of stuff. They're building the church. Yeah. As we walk up, they're putting every brick in place. And what cracked me up because I'm a woodworker. That's a whole another topic. We'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is there? Here's this man, and he's holding a string with a plumb bob, mm-hmm. and that's how he's building his wall. Mm-hmm. And then he would put the the concrete up or the the cement, and then he'd put a brick on top, and then he'd hold the plumb back on. Yeah. So I found that absolutely hilarious, but they were building the building as we're sitting there, and we're talking with the kids and all of this kind of stuff. We got to meet Pastor Steve, Mm -hmm. and Pastor Steve told us a story that when he went into this neighborhood, he He went directly to the drug dealers. He Uh went to the drug lords, and he said, "Um, much like David, uh, the Lord has told me this is where I'm going to build my church. Uh you got to be kidding me, was Mm -hmm. the attitude. Do you have any clue? Look around where you are. Yeah. And so we came in, guns Uh a-blazing, with all the love that God will give us to -hmm. give away for free. Yeah. And we came in with the shoeboxes. Uh-huh. And all of the kids were invited, Mm -hmm. the drug dealers' kids, the Uh Muslim kids, everybody, every kid was invited. And guess who bought the property next door to give to Pastor Steve because he he now needed a bigger church? Mm. The drug dealers, the drug cartels. Uh And it's that kind of story that makes you realize this was God. All the way, this was God. Yeah. And it, it was 
such a joy for me. Kids are the same the world over. Sure. I'm standing up on the stage with all of, all of the people that had come on the team, and we're laughing and clapping and dancing and worshiping and, and all this kind of stuff. And the, the boxes had already been handed out, so they've got their little booklet of the greatest gift, right. and then they have their shoe boxes, right? Yeah. And I see this kid in the front row, and he's so desperately trying to look and see what's in his box. Well, mm-hmm. he has a clear plastic one, so he's oh, obviously yeah. cheating, right? Yeah. And he's he's waving his hands, and he just happens to raise his hands up with the shoebox so he can look up into the box and see what's going on. Yeah. I don't know a kid alive that wouldn't do the same thing. Exactly. It was exactly. beautiful. And what's coming to my mind right now is really hasn't it always been since the time of Jesus, the gospel is always emphasized towards children. And haven't people always had it wrong? Even the disciples had it yes. wrong, right? They're bringing the children and they're like, oh, no, 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 take those away. Yeah, um, he, he can't be bothered with, with, with that. And he's like, no, let the children come for yeah. such as the kingdom of heaven. Um, we're still missing that today. We're still getting it wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the children in these places, in very dark places, are literally, it's, it's not like what we see so often here in America where we're begging and, and promoting and trying to lure someone maybe to come to some big VBS program we're doing. I mean, they're literally lining up in these countries just desperately waiting for these, these boxes. Right? Yes. Yeah, so um, amazing. Just amazing what God is doing. So. Yeah. And I know I, I can share with you <laughs> mm-hmm. the joy a year ago. At Global Connect. Mm-hmm. Global Connect to me was outstanding. And going to the very first Global Connect I ever went to in 2013, mm-hmm. there were almost 2,000 of us. That yeah. was astronomical. And last year, there were 6,000 Yeah, it was of crazy. Us. It was packed. It was yes. packed out. But mm-hmm. we got to meet not only brothers and sisters from around the country that are like-minded, that are mm-hmm. year-round volunteers, but also we got to meet, and I got to run into the leadership team from Uganda. Nice. Uh-huh. I got to meet the leadership team from Ukraine. Mm-hmm. My, my sadness was that Rwanda was not represented because they couldn't get them visas. Yeah. It was the country, not Samaritan's Purse that... Yeah, that was the holdup for that. But just to be with so many like-minded people, we're singing worship in six mm-hmm. different languages mm-hmm. that were posted on the board. Yeah, and then we could hear other languages that weren't didn't make the cut. Right, absolutely. Because <laughs> there are so many. It was amazing, amazing experience. So kind of like what heaven will be like. Although we'll all understand the languages once we get there. I hope so. But yeah, <laughs> so pretty cool. Well, let's. We've talked about so many great things, but um, I, I'm going to throw out a few other ones because, in addition, if you thought, you know, how does she have all the time for this? Um, she somehow finds time for even more. In addition to that, um, you're active with other hobbies. You, hobbies, some of them that you've taken up recently. You mentioned woodworking already. Yes. So. Um, and then you're here on this property. You live here with your daughter, Kim. The, you, you all have, like, there's a literal farm out here. There's, there's everything going on. We call on, it right? a farmette. Farmette, okay. <laughs> it's less than an acre, but it holds, a, it packs a wallop. Yeah, so maybe kind of go into a little bit of that. You're woodworking, the farming, everything. I mean, it's like, do you ever rest? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have time for that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, eight years ago, my daughter came to me. She had moved her job, and mm-hmm. her job now put her into traffic that was just horrible. And she said, I can't do this. She said, but let's take a look at building onto your property here mm-hmm. so that I can have my own room here at your house in Chino Hills. Yeah. And so we looked around and looked around, and I found out that the permits to build on my property were going to be over $7,000. And then I needed a geologist because I was up in the hills and it was blah, 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 blah. And I said, let's just look around and see what's available. Yes. And the whole purpose, which I love the love behind this statement, mm-hmm. Mom, let's do this when we want to, not when we have to. Yeah. 
And I so got that. Uh So we found this beautiful, beautiful piece of property in Chino. Mm -hmm. Um, It has three quarters of an acre. We're in an unincorporated area, which gives you a lot of latitude on stuff. Yeah. But when COVID hit, I'm up to my eyeballs. We're still working full time. Mm -hmm. I only retired in six months before COVID hit and put us in shutdown. That's another whole God story. Mm -hmm. But um, I had time now to unpack. Mm-hmm. It had only been four years by this time, right. but I unpacked, I have a workshop, and I have all the tools. I had forgotten how to use them, mm-hmm. and so I finally decided that I'm going to learn how to use my tools again. Uh-huh. And then um, Kim, because her whole job, she is now a controller for um, a manufacturing company, mm-hmm. She all she does all day is this. She's got the carpal tunnel to prove it. Yeah. Just sits and does mind stuff. She went into the garden and she started building the garden. Yeah. And I started working in the wood shop. So she is IT and food production mm-hmm. and I am facilities. That's my job. So I fix everything around the property. But when I turned 80, I decided mm-hmm. that I wanted to learn how to turn. I love the process. I love watching, and and I can show you, I can see it sitting here. I got a piece of firewood Uh out of my fire pile for the fireplace because my teacher said, let's take that one. And I, I, uh, okay, it's this old piece of firewood, right? Mm -hmm. It is the most magnificent olive wood you have ever seen. Mm -hmm. And it's like there's this surprise from God waiting inside everything that you, so you, that you it's make. Here? It's right over there on the table. What is it, the round? It's the round thing, yeah. That was one of the first things. Just dump the pens and everything out on the, on the couch. <laughs> that's not the couch, but that's okay. There you go. So this was a piece of firewood. Okay. Can you believe that? Look at how it's stunning yeah. and gorgeous this it's is. It's a piece of firewood. Yeah, you'd never, we, you'd we never call it, guess it. Yeah. Uh, you can, the, the best, yeah, and there's jokes among the wood turning community. One of them is, where do you get your, where do you get your wood? Mm-hmm. Trees, mainly. OTG, on and the so ground. So you don't go to Home Depot and buy the, <laughs> no. the pre-cut things? Okay. And this is called... <laughs> Ditch wood. But isn't that stunning? And the yeah. smell. Yeah. You can smell the olive wood in it. Like you can smell it. And I feel like everything that I make is just homage mm-hmm. to the creation yeah. and the creator. Pretty awesome. Yeah, I, he's, 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 in, he's incredible. And the deeper you get into it and the more species of wood you find out about and all of this kind of stuff, it's just amazing mm-hmm. to be part of God's world. And this isn't perfection yet. Right. We're still flawed. Yep. So, I, yeah, I'm very proud of that. That was one of my very first things. That's, that's incredible. I mean, I remember my wood shop in middle school totally messing everything up, so I'm impressed, yeah. I'm a great teacher, and that's another whole God story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have all kinds of God stories. Amen. All right, well, here's, here's an interesting question for you. I'm going to throw this one out. We're no, take the a, rest of them haven't been interesting? No, they've all been interesting. <laughs> But I like to throw out weird questions. Okay, so we get in a time machine, and we go back in time, and you find yourself and visit yourself at 20 years old. Okay? What does the 20-year-old think? Do they even recognize, and would they ever even have believed that this is you now at 81? And what would you want to tell that 20-year-old? Don't be stupid. Okay. I, I think a lot of us, when we're older, would go back and tell ourselves that, right? Yeah. <sighs> it wasn't until I surrendered my life that I really started to live. Mm-hmm. Because his plan was so incredible. And you've known me 
for all of these years now. Right. And you've heard so many of my stories that I never, never would have dreamed. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I grew up poor. Yeah. I remember going hungry. My parents were both alcoholics. Mm-hmm. And to see the life that the Lord had planned for me ahead of time, I could have been in that life at 20. Yeah. Not 48. I was 48 when I accepted the Lord. Mm-hmm. So I missed out 28 years. And I, that never should have happened. But I could see where the Lord was preparing me for the journey that I'm on now. Right. With all of those sufferings, with all of those experiences. Yeah. To make me the woman that I am now. Mm-hmm. That I can, I can profess unabashedly. I'm a Christ follower. Yeah. And I I go nuts when I hear people say, "Oh, the big man and I have a we have a we have a deal." Yeah. Well, God yeah. and I have an understanding. Mhm. Really. Yeah. I'm not buying that. I've heard that a lot, but yeah. yes. So, there's there's the part of you that says, "Wow, I wish it was earlier." Mm-hmm. Yet at the same time, you see in God's perfect plan how what wasn't earlier makes up a lot of maybe your drive now. Yes. It also contributes to my urgency to mm-hmm. tell people about the evangelistic parts of compassion mm-hmm. and especially Operation Christmas Child. Mm-hmm. And um, with those two, and with even with the widows, know that the next chapter is going to be different. Yeah, we never go through the same thing from one day to the next, unless we're in a rut so deep that we enjoy boredom. Sure. So the Lord has such an incredible plan and such an incredible life for those that are willing mm-hmm. to move forward into His realm. One thing that comes to my mind that I've had this thought recently, um, and I'm sure you do, is, you know, in economics, there's this thing called supply and demand. Mm -hmm. So the less supply there is, the more valuable something becomes. Um, Is that kind of the push? Because I know, like, even if I'm doing a message or I'm, I'm doing something, it's like, well, how many more of these do I have? Exactly. So they have more value then, oh, I've got a ton of them, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You take it more seriously. So is that kind of in your head sometimes? I mean, it, it's morbid to think about that all the time, but but it's, it's like, hey, uh, these things have value, so I take them with more seriousness. They, they're more urgent to me. Yes, but mm-hmm. the more that you focus on the eternal mm-hmm. and the heavenly kingdom, the less you want here. I'm going through a stage right now where I'm purging. Okay. So I don't have to put that burden on my daughter. Okay. You know? And what did I want all this stuff for anyway? Yeah. Now it's clutter. Right. Now it's messing up my life because I don't need it. I don't want it. I don't use it. And what a waste. Yeah. It all was. Where in the beginning, I thought I had to have it. Yeah. You know, and and it's it's been um, a complete flip of my thinking as far as I can't wait to see Jesus. So I'm thinking of Hebrews chapter 12, where it's saying, you know, um, to run the race that's set aside, you know, cut mm-hmm. aside the sin and everything that entangles, and looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So, so you're getting that picture in your mind of. Okay, the finish line is in sight at some point. Yes. But the real person who runs the race well leans into it. Yes. They're not just hanging back and crawling. They're they're running towards it as full speed with everything they've got. So is that kind of where, where you where, how you think? Yes. Um, <laughs> Billy Graham wrote a book, Nearer mm-hmm. to Home, mm-hmm. and he talked about how much sweeter heaven is looking. I recently, um, over Christmas, lost my only great-grandchild, 
through miscarriage. She was only 20 weeks along. Okay. And I am overjoyed that I will see her. Absolutely. Yeah. While the loss is great here, I will see her. And I know that. Yeah. Definitely. That's definitely a comfort and, and something to look forward to, right? Yes. My mother is up there. My husband's up there. Yeah. And it's going to be shocking to find out who made it and who didn't. True. I'm, I just am in confident in my faith yeah. that um, I will be one of his. He's already showed that to me many times. No doubt. No doubt. I, I, I'm very confident in it as well from everything <laughs> that I've seen. So um, Goals. Goals. I don't know if we make goals or we just take every day and just go full speed. Is there something that, that God still, besides the countries? Well, one of the themes <laughs> that we had with our Connect conference just a few weeks ago was when Franklin said to the entire audience, well, we don't make plans. And uh, Randy Riddle, who was the, yeah. <laughs> the leader, said, yes, we do. <laughs> because of what I have seen happen over my lifetime— I never make plans. Mm -hmm. Why would I make the plans when he's got the best plans? True. Right now, my plans are to go to the Dominican Republic on a cruise with my niece in October. Okay. That'll be country 62. My next plan after that is on my cruise. I'm going to Chile, Uruguay, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and my seventh continent. Okay. But until I get in that seat on that airplane, I don't get excited about it. I don't plan much about it because mm -hmm. I know that I could wind up in Timbuktu yeah. leading a Bible study. Mm -hmm. That's just the way the Lord has run my life. Right. And his, his plans are always better. True. Absolutely. I have had... Such excitement in my life, such reward in my life, such incredible gifts of people and friends and ministries. And I leave it up to him. Makes sense. It, so I don't plan. I'm, I'm Franklin. I don't plan. Makes sense. <laughs> Last question. This has been a great time. It's been an awesome time, so I've appreciated it. I know it's going to be a huge blessing to people that are out there. Uh, last question, though, and I'm going to let you kind of direct it. You can look right at the camera if you want or however you want to do it. Um, you've lived with faith, mm -hmm. and you've lived many years without faith. So, as you said already, there's a lot of people out there that are still searching. And maybe they don't even know what the life of faith is. So what do you want to tell them as the Lord leads you right now about the difference between the two and why they should trust and turn to Jesus? What I've been very saddened by, in the, especially in the last few years, is the hopelessness and the anxiety and the fear and everybody just holding their breath over... What's going to happen next? And, and how can I get away from whatever the issue is? I have a stone that I painted that's out in front of my house that says, fear not. And hanging off of it is a face mask. Fear not. God is with you. And God will guide and direct your steps so that when you get this fear... He's got a plan. He has a fabulous plan. When I was at my lowest low as a brand new widow, one of my sweet sisters gave me a little Dollar Tree calendar, and on it was Jeremiah 29, 11. And most believers know that verse. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. And they are to prosper you and give you hope. Know he's in control. Know he's got your back. Know that he loves you. And he only has the best in store for you. But our ultimate goal is to be with him in his kingdom for eternity. 
and that's going to be a great time. Amen. So that's our hope for you. That's why we do these podcasts. Uh, maybe you're out there and experiencing faith. You don't have to be a person of faith to listen to these podcasts, but we want you to understand the difference that it makes. Uh, if they want to contact you, they can find you on Facebook, right? Yes. Ellie Graves on Facebook. Is there an email address in case they don't have Facebook? E.K. Graves, L-N-C, not I-N-C, at msn.com. There you go. So I'm sure that if you reach out, you would get back to them, right? Absolutely. Definitely. So I'm, I'm sure that you've inspired many today. And who knows? Some are going to see this right away, and it could be a couple of years from now or whatever when some people see it. But uh, we just want to encourage you uh, to follow God's plan that He has for your life. She already mentioned it in Jer- Jeremiah 29, 11. And there's no better life than that. So thank you so much for joining us today. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast, share it, and other episodes with as many people as possible. God bless you, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor.